All right. Cheers and salutations. So it's been a while, and I uh, was at the uh, <clears throat> anime convention here in Chicago, and I was there to uh, meet up with uh, our good friend Lauren, as well as a few other members of our team. And for a long time, if you've been watching this YouTube channel, I've never said its name because I was afraid that I was pronouncing it. I was going to pronounce it wrong. And Lauren corrected me, and the name of the channel is Chicanime. So from here on out, welcome to Chicanime. Please be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. <laughs> I can see people type in the comment section. So wait a minute, dude. You're telling me this whole time you didn't even know how to say your YouTube channel's name? Hashtag unsubscribe. No, but anyway, Chicanime, 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 Chicanime. <laughs> So, yeah, here we are, we're, but this video is going to be a little bit different. We're checking out from Annie News, Goblin Slayer content. What did the anime change? So, for those who don't know, I'm watching uh, Goblin Slayer, and I was not prepared for the anarchy in episode one. I made myself a nice snack, had a glass of wine, and I just wasn't ready for the anarchy, okay? I just wasn't ready for it. So, without further ado, let's check this video out. In a three, a two, and an uno. Surprisingly, for Goblin Slayer, the anime was actually pretty faithful to the manga. So this type of cut content video will probably not be anything nearly as in-depth in comparison to what I do for my Overlord ones. Mm. It'll be more of just like a simple overview of what the manga had that the anime didn't. I mean, this isn't a very complex show. Pretty much what you see is what you get. Sure, there were a few world-building events that were skipped over, but certainly nothing at the same caliber of detail as Overlord. Now, if you're wondering why I'm doing the manga instead of the light novels, it's because that I've read that the novels deal more with the characters and their interactions with each other rather than the events that are happening around them. Whereas with the manga, we're presented a more in-depth showcase of these events. It's really just a difference of perspectives between the two mediums. Plus, there was really no way I would catch up with the novels in time. Now, let's take a look at what exactly was missed from the first three episodes of the anime. Hmm. In episode 1, we're introduced to a new and very naive set of porcelain-ranked adventurers. And as we know, they recruit our priestess to perform this urgent quest to go slay some goblins. Of course, that didn't turn out very well for them. No. But what the anime had I wasn't- I'm not ready for that. I wasn't ready, still not ready. ...skipped was the brief yet pretty relevant backstories of each of the members of this group before they were, well, you know. Ah. We first have the wizard, who was a promising and skilled graduate from the magical arts program at the Sorcerer's Academy, noted by her instructors to have both talent and strong work ethic, setting her up as this figure with great potential to make it quite far with her gifts. Even the magical staff that she uses was granted to her upon graduation as a gift to recognize and honor her hard work. Then we have the warrior, who grew up listening to all the cool tales and- hmm. Oh no, uh, he just wanted to be a hero. ...and stories of the adventurers, along with their close encounters with death, which he idolized and fawned over. The one that he recalled before literally getting axed was of this party who found a treasure chest that turned out to be a trap. The trap opened up a pit that would drop the victim into an ambush set up by monsters. So the whole party follows suit and jumps in after their fallen comrade, since apparently when on an adventure, no man gets left behind. Of course, since they're alive to tell this story, they were able to make it out after a fierce battle. But the last thing he remembered before taking that knife to the leg was that the only reason that the party was able to make it out of that pit trap alive was because of the experience that they had gained together through past adventures. Then we have the oh, fighter, no. a homegrown martial artist who trained happily with her dad to learn oh, what no. she now uses to fight. Though when her dad had passed away, she decided to become an adventurer so she could use her father's teachings to help others. We're given three brief stories of young adventurers who, if not so eager to move up the ranks, may have very well become famous adventurers or well-known heroes. But sadly, their potential to grow was cut short by their own short-sightedness and lack of experience adventuring together. It kind of tricks you into thinking that, oh, they're showing us their backstory. That means they're probably going to live, right? Since that's typically how it goes. No. And then five seconds later, oh, that just happened. Sure, these scenes could have been helpful to properly introduce and emphasize the point that this world is a more dark version of your typical fantasy one. Though I wouldn't say it's entirely necessary since it would detract from the screen time of the more relevant characters. 
Regardless, it sets up the first hints as to why Goblin Slayer's existence is a necessary one, and this is reinforced even more so through the next couple sets of skipped scenes. In Episode 2, which covers the events from Chapter 3, after the old man had put in his request to exterminate the goblins that were plaguing his village, the guild girl gives a more detailed exposition on the current state as to why goblin quests are handled the way that they are. After seeing the feeble amount that the old man could provide as payment, we're told that with that type of pay, only the porcelain-ranked adventurers would be willing to take it, but that was already explained in the anime. She then goes on to refer to goblin attacks as this constant, something that will always happen because there's just so many of them. She likens them to children, who not only have an advantage in numbers, but can also be much smarter and stronger than we give them credit for. The troubles that these goblins cause, though, never seem to warrant a high pay. It's usually just these villages out in the boonies, who have to scrape together whatever cash they can find, which normally doesn't amount to much. This leads to a cycle where, because the payout is so low, higher-ranked adventurers don't take them, leaving only those who are willing to work for less available so the porcelains and the newbies. But more times than not, these newbies will underestimate the goblins that they're up against and often get injured or killed in the process. Even if that was to happen, the quest still remains until one novice group finally gets lucky enough to complete the job. And since the job does get done eventually, even if it was at the expense of a few groups of rookies, the state wouldn't do anything to change the system, leaving the hmm. people managing the adventurer's guild two options. Either lead a group of beginners to their death, or just let the village burn. They even went so far as to show how many requests were being made by villagers about goblin attacks, followed by the unwillingness of strong adventurers to take them on. But once goblins... Yeah, see, again, what, what I really liked about the anim uh, about this anime so far is he's dedicated on killing the goblins. I mean, he wants them dead. He doesn't like them. He doesn't respect them. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, good. And after what they did in that first episode, Scumbag goblins, uh, kill them all! Slayer shows up as the only capable one who's actually willing to do these quests, the changes are noticeable. Though it is only a few pages of exposition, it shows why the guild girl likes him so much, as well as why his existence is such a crucial one in this type of world. Not only does he save the lives of the villagers, he also saves the lives of the rookies who would otherwise go in his stead. The next major difference wasn't really a cutscene, but rather a change in the flow of events. While Priestess and Goblin Slayer are raiding the nest in the anime, that's when Goblin Slayer gives his whole backstory, along with his own personal reason for existing. In the manga, this actually takes place in the Adventurer's Guild, when the guild girl was asking to herself why goblins are always raiding the villages, almost trying to put some reason behind their actions, as if it was something that the goblins enjoy doing. This is when Goblin Slayer chimes in to explain why, but his answer seemed like he was talking about himself. You see, he uses himself as an example as to why goblins do what they do. If you remember during his little backstory... Ah, uh, jeez, not this one. Probably what happened to his sister too, jeez. He recalls when his village was attacked, and how because he survived, he now uses every fiber of his being to get revenge. Eventually, he got to the point where he started to take pleasure in hunting these goblins. Now, in your head, just flip these scenarios around so that the adventurers are the ones that initially invaded the goblin nest and killed everyone, but they had missed a young one or just stupidly let it go. This young one then grows up and becomes smarter and stronger, just like Goblin Slayer to get revenge. Eventually, it'll lead its own nest and get yep. that revenge by raiding a village, only to realize that they actually enjoyed it. So they do it over and over again, just like Goblin Slayer hunts them over and over again. It's two sides of the same coin, which is why Goblin Slayer says he is to goblins what goblins are to them. When I think that's a perfect analogy, I didn't know that. When you really think about it from this perspective, it's actually a pretty interesting way of presenting the cyclic nature of the state of events of this world, and I don't think that I properly interpreted it this way when I had watched the anime. Plus, we also got this really cool visual of Goblin Slayer in his own version of the Berserker armor, though it's most likely to show how much of a monster he looks to the goblins when he's hunting them, more than it is an actual reference. You know, just like how the goblins, I'm sure, appear terrifying when they're attacking a village. Shortly after that, when Goblin Slayer inquires about the goblin requests for the day, he's offered three, and we're shown his reasoning behind picking the two that he did. The two that he chose were both in the same direction, 
But more than that, the old man who had reported that goblins were stealing chickens was what, in the end, made Goblin Slayer accept the quest. Because the goblins were reported to be stealing food, Goblin Slayer noted that it couldn't be the work of a horde, but rather just a small number of goblins. But given enough time, those few goblins could very well establish a nest. As such, he reasons that it's best to eliminate the problem at its source, instead of allowing it to grow and become a bigger one somewhere down the road. Now, the second quest, which was referred to as the Northern Mountain Castle that had become a goblin nest, mm -hmm. was briefly mentioned in the anime as to already having some adventurer casualties. But in the manga, they actually show the poor souls who adventured into this old elf. Oh no. No. Elven fortress in an attempt to save the already captured victims. We're shown this rescue party of. Okay. We'll go in during the day when they're asleep, watching for traps. We can take out the guards, rescue the girls they took from the village. Got it? Oh no, and they're all done for. All female adventurers, and they don't seem to be rookies since they appear to have at least some experience working together. So as they enter, one of them spots a captured girl from the village and then goes to help. But she was actually laid there as a trap. If her body was moved, it would release a heavy bag of items hanging from the trees. The noise of the bag hitting the ground was set up as some type of makeshift early warning system that the goblins would use to become aware of intruders. So then the goblins surround them, and everything after that isn't really worth sharing. But the trap in itself just goes to show that goblins can be intuitive creatures, and they are capable of overcoming adventurers given their massive numbers. Now we can fast forward to when Goblin Slayer is burning down the fort. We're shown the reactions of the villagers who had been affected by the recent attacks. As they see the smoke from the distance, they know what has just happened, and we get to see at a basic level what the results of Goblin Slayer's actions really are. But other than that, I don't think that there was too much else cut from the first three episodes of the anime, if anything at all. Oh, but if it did ever cross your mind, yeah, there are no names in this anime, only titles. And yeah, this... I... I, 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 I noticed that. I noticed that a lot. Oh, oh hey, well... Pause at a perfect time. Oh yeah. Yeah, she actually talks like that in the manga, and it's incredibly annoying to read. Uh, oh, so she does talk like that. Okay, now I'm sure you could tell that this isn't quite as complex as Overlord, but I believe there are scenes that are worth mentioning as they do drive home certain elements of the story. Plus, I really just wanted to talk a bit about Goblin Slayer. Personally, I am enjoying this show. It's the type of fantasy and action that appeals to me, just like Overlord does and just like Sword Art Online does. So if there are more changes from the manga, I'll probably make another cut content video, most likely one every three episodes, if there's even enough to talk about. As for the characters, I don't really think there's enough info on them to do a single video explanation. Though, that could be something to be found from the novels. After all, there are six volumes, and the anime has really only made it a bit more than halfway through the first, so there's definitely still plenty oh. more source material to go over. If you want, feel free to come discuss it with me in my Discord. Anyway, before I go, if you're new here and also happen to be a fan of Overlord, I do have a few videos on those which may interest you, as well as quite a few fate ones. But as always, thank you so much for watching, and be sure to let me know whether you enjoyed this video or not mm -hmm. in the comments below. I'd love to get your thoughts on it. But until next time, ciao! Okay, well, uh, I learned a lot. Obviously, they kept the anime, the anime as faithful to the manga as possible. I mean, obviously, who doesn't like to see more content? But hey, that's that's what buying the books, the light novels, the manga. I mean, that's that's what you that's what you want to do. Um, but okay. I'm I'm glad we didn't go over too much of what happened in episode one because um I'm still recovering from that little traumatic event. Yeah, it started off as a fun adventure. And then there's running and screaming and terror. I wasn't ready for that anarchy. But it's but it's good to see. And so you know what, folks? I'm gonna follow up on this and see the next drop the, the next drop. The next Nextra that doesn't exist. The next Goblin Slayer cut content. The only way you're going to find out is if you like, comment, share, and subscribe. And hit that ring bell notification for 
Shikaname. That's right. For a long time, I haven't been saying this channel's YouTube name because I didn't know how to pronounce it. And I just said, hey, Lauren, how do you pronounce our channel's name? And she's oh, it's a Shikaname. H have you not been saying it? I was like, no, I haven't. I haven't because I was afraid I might get it wrong. But okay, it's Shikaname. I did it. Woo! Thank you.